Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. That was so fun, I'm going to do it again. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Friday, March 8th. My name is Tom Lucchese, and I'm a partner with the law firm of Baker and Hostetler. And on behalf of my firm and its partners and its employees, I am pleased to introduce the 2024 High School Debate Championship. It's the final round of competition for the North Coast District of the National Speech and Debate Association. I wish good luck to both of our debaters here today. Um, this event is part of the City Club's continuing commitment to young people in our community. And at Baker and Hostetler, we support this event as a way to celebrate the memory of our late partner, Patrick Jordan. There's, there will be a picture of Patrick uh, coming up in a minute. It's one of my favorite pictures of him. It, it captures uh, his essence. Um, Pat was at the firm for a short period of time beginning in 1987. Uh, most of you, all, none of you students were born in 1987. In fact, some of your parents probably weren't born in 1987. Um, but Pat was with the firm from 87 when I first met him until 1995 when he unfortunately passed away, uh, leaving behind his wife and daughter, who was about one year old at the time. Um, Pat's wife is here with us today, Sharon Sobel Jordan. Um, Pat's brother, Tom Jordan. Pat's sister, Maggie Keeney. Um, and Tom Jordan's son, Tip, is, is here with us today. And this is a day uh, that we, we really remember Pat and, and his essence. Um, and frankly, most of us remember Pat every day. Pat was larger than life, and um, you guys are all savvy with the internet. I'm sure you've seen uh, the speech I give uh, every year about Pat, talking about how he negotiated with a restaurant owner in town to take over the business, um, to buy out the restaurant owner's business, and how it was hotly contested and hotly debated, and yet when they were done, they'd reached a resolution and they parted as friends, and they were lifelong friends after that point, and that, that embodies Pat. Uh, that embodies his personality, embodies his style. Um, I don't know if you saw the president on TV last night for the State of the Union address, but the president said that we are at a crossroads. Never in the history of the United States, in the recent history at least, of the United States has, been, has democracy been so challenged. We are on the precipice. Um, and debate and arguing is prevalent <laughs> throughout the community. Uh, when we were younger, and back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, when Pat was around, he was an arguer. He was a fierce arguer. And we would debate everything. The lunch, lunches were nothing but constant arguments among friends. And we would argue. We didn't have the internet. We couldn't fact check. We would just make stuff up. You would, you would argue, and the sheer force of personality sometimes would prevail. And that was often Pat. It was almost always Pat. A big guy who was left-handed and he would just wave that arm and dismiss your arguments like they were nothing. Um, but we've lost, as the president pointed out last night, we have lost the ability as a nation to have debate in a reasonable and measured manner. And, and today's debate, I think, will remind us that you can present argument without attacking the other party. You can rely upon facts and research and hard work, rather than misinformation and fake news and innuendo to make your points. And you can respect your opponent and respond to your opponent's differences of opinion with reason and eloquent words, rather than harassment and vindictiveness and going back against each other. And this is a big problem in the country right now. It's a problem that your generation is going to be greatly affected by. Um, I don't want to preach too much, but 
I blame the internet. Everybody's on their phones. It's very easy to be critical of other people, and that's carried over to face-to-face -face conversations, which is really, it's un-American, it's inappropriate, and it's counterproductive. So as we watch these two people, Brooke and Max, debate today, um, just keep in mind the broad, broader principles. Um, we're going to have, a, they're both winners. Um, so someone's got to be deemed the champion, but at the end of the day, just keep in mind the broader principles and the implications for society. Um, as you young people go out into the world, keep in mind the lessons you've learned um, as, you, as you debate. Pat would be really, really honored to know that some 29 years after his passing, I think I did the math right, um, we're still remembering him and remembering him in this manner. So today's competitors will square off in a Lincoln-Douglas style debate. And I know Dan knows nothing about debate, but I know even less. Um, but it emphasizes logic, ethical values, and philosophy. Uh, this style of debate is named after the famous 1858 debates between candidates Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. I don't know who won that. I know who won the presidency. I don't know who won the debate. Um, but joining us today as our on-air on commentators are Mike McIntyre, uh, who's been introduced. He's the executive director of IdeaStream Public Media. Um, and last year's runner-up, uh, Caitlin Ernst with Laurel School, um, who will now introduce our judges, uh, the competitors, the resolution, and explain the debate format. Caitlin? I'd first like to thank the City Club of Cleveland, as well as the law firm of Baker and Haasettler for supporting today's championship. The City Club debate is such an incredible opportunity for us high school debaters, and we are endlessly grateful for their support of our activity. Lincoln-Douglas debate is a one-on-one -on -one debate in which we discuss policies and government actions through the lens of philosophy. Typically, LD debates concern themselves with deciding whether or not certain actions or states of affair are moral or immoral. To do so, each debater will introduce a value, what we as a society should value above all else. Then they will offer a value criterion, a mechanism to achieve that value. Finally, the debaters will offer contentions, arguments, and evidence as to why affirming or negating the resolution will achieve that value in the value criterion. Throughout the debate, each debater will offer rebuttals as to why their position is true and the opponent's is false, in hopes of convincing the judges to vote in favor of them. Today, our finalists will debate the topic resolved. Uh, the primary objective of the United States criminal justice system ought to be rehabilitation. The debaters will be Max Zuckerman on the affirmative, a senior at Solon High School coached by Trina Castro and Matt Hill, as well as Brooke Ametchu on the negative, a sophomore at Hawkins School coached by Robert Schertz and Eva Lamberson. Judging today's debate are Corinne Lashley, the speech and debate coach at Chagrin Falls High School, Rich Kowalix, OSDA Hall of Fame speech and debate coach at Laurel School, and finally, artist A. Arnold III, managing director at Huntington National Bank and City Club board member. And now over to Mac McIntyre. Caitlin, uh, Caitlin is working her way over here so that we can uh, have a conversation. What we're going to do here is try to explain for those who aren't regular debate watchers, and that's not anybody here in this audience, they're all debate oriented. But if you're listening on the radio, watching on television, we're going to try to explain the process. And part of our duty too is to fill in the time because the debaters have time to prepare each one of their arguments, the affirming and the negating arguments. And so when they're doing that and the rebuttals, et cetera, we'll be able to talk a little bit, and I don't know anything about it, but Caitlin's going to be able to give me some information. She was amazing last year, and Caitlin, it's good to see you again. Not only were you the runner-up here at the City Club, but you also were the state champion last year. <laughs> I was, yeah. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's hear it for Caitlin. Uh, we are going to be hearing from, as you just mentioned, Max Zuckerman of Solon High School. He's affirming and Brooke Gometschu from Hawkins School, she is negating. So that would mean Max is up first, and if you're ready, Max, why don't we get you up and, and get started. Okay, is anyone not ready? All right, let's begin now. I affirm resolved, the primary objective of the United States criminal justice system ought to be rehabilitation. I value justice, defined as to each their due. Because a government's sole purpose is to protect the dues of citizens, justice is paramount in today's debate. 
To achieve justice, we must first look to the idea of preventing dehumanization, defined by Oxford as the denial of human dignity for three reasons. First, human dignity is the foundation of all other ethical considerations. Altiero 20 explains that human dignity requires a priority of consideration, even before freedom, responsibility, solidarity, and other factors. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights furthers that the recognition of the inherent dignity of all is the foundation of justice. Second, dehumanization is the root of injustice. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy explains that we have a duty to never treat humans as a means to an end. Violating this duty by definition constitutes a failure to give each their due. And third, Rao 11 explains that human dignity is deeply embedded in constitutional law. If the criminal justice system is to abide by the constitution, it must prevent dehumanization. I also offer two quick observations. First, the NSDA writes that each debater has the equal burden to prove the validity of their side of the resolution as a general principle, not any specific policy. And second, rehabilitation does not mean no punishment. Instead, Douglas 22 finds that rehabilitation ought to be conceived as an aspect of or in addition to punishment. Thus, the burden of the negative is to prove that the punishment ought to be weighed over any chance of rehabilitation. Contention one, the focus on punishment has led to dehumanizing conditions within the criminal justice system. Vera 24 finds that today, nearly two million people are incarcerated, warehoused in cramped spaces that lack fresh air, healthy food, natural light, and proper health care. Prisons are run with little to no public oversight leading to abuse. Unfortunately, incarcerated people endure humiliating treatment, inhumane conditions, and abusive interactions, which lead to significant trauma and harm people's efforts to thrive once they leave prison. <laughs> A nationwide study by the Institute on Drug Abuse at, in 2020 outlined that 85% of the prison population has a substance use disorder and are at a higher risk of overdose following release. Bender 18 furthers that nearly half of incarcerated individuals do not hold a high school diploma. For these two reasons, Maloney 21 analyzed that the unemployment rate among the formerly incarcerated is higher than unemployment at any point in U.S. history. Thus, Zucas 14 terminalizes that most prisoners will fail unless they are provided with meaningful rehabilitative programming. An internal revision must take place for a person to change their ways. Contention 2. The focus on imprisonment has led to a dehumanizing cycle of crime and mass incarceration. A 2023 report by the Department of Justice explains that the get tough on crimes approach where offenders are punished rather than rehabilitated has been counterproductive. The number of offenders in prisons has increased and the crime rate is growing because mass incarceration causes a vicious cycle creating more crime. Schrager 15 explains that putting more people in prison not only ruins lives, but also creates more new crime than it prevents. Harvard professor Benecci 21 explains that within three years of their release, two out of three former prisoners are rearrested and more than half are incarcerated again. Each year in prison increases the odds that a prisoner reoffends, turning small offenders into career criminals. Being a convicted felon dis disqualifies you from housing, voting, and reduces the odds of post-release employment by 24% each year. Being in prison and out of the labor force degrades legitimate skills and exposes you to criminal skills, making crime a more attractive alternative upon release. Ultimately, incarceration ruins innocent people's lives and encourages crime, forcing people to become career criminals. Contention three, rehabilitation prevents dehumanization. First, recognize the end goal of the criminal justice system. Per the Department of Justice, the main goal behind punishment is to protect future crime prevent, excuse me. Offenders must develop skills and work on their mental health to be reintegrated into society. This is best achieved through a rehabilitative system, as Smith 09 finds that the evidence for effective intervention spans over two decades and encompasses hundreds of studies on the topic of offender treatment outcome, and the results have been replicated with remarkable consistency. Treatments adhering to the principles of effective intervention are effective in reducing recidivism. In an empirical analysis of American rehabilitation programs, SEGAFO 17 finds that the recidivism rate for inmates dropped from 49% to 20% and noted a recidivism rate for incarcerated mothers more than four times lower than those that were not exposed to the same programs. 
The same is true around the world. Dahl 20 finds that Norway's criminal justice system serves as proof that a focus on rehabilitation increases job training, raises employment, and reduces crime. There are large spillovers for criminal networks that provide additional benefits in terms of crime reduction. Even in societies where extreme punishment in the norm is the norm, rehabilitation has proven effective. A multi-year study on Singapore by Ling 16 finds that since the launch of re Singapore's rehabilitation efforts, Singaporeans are generally more willing to foster relationships with ex-offenders and companies are more open to hiring them. In turn, recidivism rates have lowered substantially. Without enough assistance, ex-offenders often find themselves isolated and destitute, often resorting to deviant activities. Thus, Futch 17 concludes that the criminal justice system must offer the chance to live a life without crime by helping change the context in which criminals find themselves in, which can only be achieved through rehabilitation. If the system is constructed in this way, crime will be lessened, society will be safer, and victims and offenders will be helped, thereby preventing dehumanization and a achieving justice. Thus, I affirm. Ready for cross? Great. I'll begin time on my first word. So let's look to your framework and your value criteria and where you tell us that in today's debate we look to preventing dehumanization. So is this just as a principle that we should treat people in ways in which, for example, their autonomy isn't like infringed upon? Part of it, but like in general, we find that in almost every case where dehumanization occurs, it is directly linked with hatred and violence, and most mass moral atrocities that we can think of are directly okay. caused by dehumanization. So we're looking to things like reducing like hatred, violence, etc. Sure, that's part okay. of it. Okay, sure. So let's go to your observation. You say that we should be debating this as an equal burden, like of a principle, not a policy. Does the resolution ask us to only look at how it would work as a principle independent of how it's implemented in the United States? Um, implementation may have part of it, but the point of this observation is to say that we're not looking at, say, okay, what does Obama think about the criminal sure. justice system or Biden or someone else? We're looking at the general idea of criminal justice and what an ideal in like a utopian society, what okay. a criminal justice system would look like. Sure, let's go to your first contention. So you talk about overcrowding. What is the root cause of why we see like a lot of people funneled into prison or overcrowding in general? Um, there's a lot of different root causes. I'm not sure I can like pinpoint one specific thing. Okay. I'm, I'm sure part of it is like the context in which sure. people come from. Part of it might be like the like their economic status or like their okay. social status. Social background, sure. sure. So let's look to like your two specific warrants. You talk about substance use disorders and sort of education. So how would we see that rehabilitation like like effectively removes the overcrowding issue or like stops mass incarceration just because we're giving people these opportunities? Sure, so I'm glad you asked that. Part of that is the Zuki's 14 evidence I give you, which tells you that we need an internal revision to take place. Otherwise, we have these issues just continuing, which is what happens right now in the status quo. Sure. And then the second part, most of the solvency is in the contention three, where we find per Segafo 17, Dahl 20, and Wing 16 that not only have different programs such as like in North Dakota and Oklahoma, have they already worked? That's the Segafo okay, evidence. Sure. But also internationally in Norway, so, that's Dahl, and in Singapore, that's right, Ling. Sure. These so all I hear work. the country examples. So I guess we're just looking at to like decreasing recidivism in this contention. Uh, that's part of it, but we also find that this type of stuff is also very closely relate related to the dehumanization that occurs in my contention one and okay, two. Okay, sure. So let's look to, I guess, specifically dehumanization as a concept. So you talk about like how people are being limited for opportunities and things. I guess just directly in the affirmative, what are like the root causes or main things that cause dehumanization in prison? Sure. So the main things that cause it are A, these poor, like the poor conditions, that's Vera 24 and the Institute on Drug Abuse, and then B, this idea of the vicious crime cycle, where this focus on punishment essentially that we see right now doesn't actually prevent crime. It actually exacerbates it. That's okay. our own Department of Justice telling us sure. that we need something to change. Okay. So let's look, I guess, to the cycle of repeat offending or recidivism. So you talk about how a lot of people are funneled back into the system. How does the affirmative, or the affirmative uniquely solve for this issue when we look to things like social backgrounds that are often root causes of why people enter? Prison? Sure. So again, it comes back to the contention three, which tells us that only through the rehabilitation system can we see recidivism rates dropping. We see this for the different groups that you're talking about. I give you in the Sega evidence, the incarcerated sure. mothers, their recidivism rates dropped by over four times. Okay. We saw a 2.5x reduction in rates per sure. the same evidence. So all of these issues are being solved for. Okay, sounds good. All right, so we've got some time for preparation for the next step here. Let's find out from, I'm Mike McIntyre, by the way, and I'm with Caitlin Ernst to find out a little bit about what we just heard. Lincoln Douglas is one of many debate styles. Can you explain what we just saw and how to distinguish that from other kinds of debate? Absolutely. So the key difference between Lincoln Douglas debate and other forms is that it's focused primarily on values. 
That is, at the beginning of Max's speech, he said, my value is justice, my value criterion, preventing dehumanization. So the debaters aren't just trying to prove whether or not a policy is effective or not, but rather if it is moral. And then how, what we saw here was the affirmative constructive that Max did, and then the cross-examination -exam from Brooke. In her cross, what's she trying to do? Essentially, Brooke is trying to poke and prod into Max's constructive and find the weak spots within it. So she might agree that it has problems, but she's asking if the affirmative can actually solve for them. And these things are obviously ruled by a clock. Max had six minutes, there was three minutes for the cross. You heard Brooke say, okay, right, and move on to the next thing. Part of that is it's her time. Definitely. So you're in a very tight time frame in that we only had three minutes. So if you have a large number of questions you want to ask, you might have to cut off your opponent. So let's talk about the evidence. At one point when he was asked about what he had said, he said, I refer you back to the piece of evidence that I gave. So I would think that in debate and in this kind of format, I know you are, uh, but what am I, is probably not a good argument. Instead, they're pointing to debate evidence that they've gathered. How does that evidence get gathered and what are they referring to? Definitely. Evidence is really crucial in LD debate. So essentially the month or so before the actual debate on the topic happens, debaters will be preparing for this. So they'll be researching on Google or even in academic journals trying to find substantive evidence as to why their claims are true. And they got the topic recently, right? This is a new topic starting in March. This is a new topic, correct? Yeah. Last year when you were debating, it was about open borders. Resolve justice requires open borders for human migration. That's something we're still talking about today in the country and in fact across the world. What these guys are dealing with is real world stuff. Absolutely, the topics of our debates are really key to the political debates happening in our country and beyond. So do you wish the debates that are happening in our country were a little more like these? <laughs> Part of me definitely does. It makes it a lot more simple when you're um, like moderated by time frames and you actually have to provide evidence. <laughs> when you talk about actually providing evidence, that means doing research. That means doing the work. <laughs> yes. Oh, and when Brooke is ready, are you ready to go, Brooke? Okay, so we're going to suspend here. We'll pick this up a little bit later. But now uh, is uh, coming up is Brooke, yes. and she's going to be delivering the uh, negative constructive. Okay. And then for the judges, I pause that prep there at 2.30. Is everybody ready for the negative constructive and the negative rebuttal to the affirmative case? Great. If everybody's good to go, I'll begin time on my first word. I negate. Because the resolution asks us to examine what a government ought to do, I value justice in today's debate, defined as giving each their dues, the same as my opponents. But the value criterion in today's round ought to be minimizing societal suffering. Prefer this value criterion for the following two reasons. First, minimizing suffering is a prerequisite for all other human values. In a society with high amounts of suffering, other human values cease to develop because humans lose a desire to deliberate or uphold any values other than those directly concerning their immediate survival and well-being. For instance, someone suffering with starvation might justify theft in order to reduce their suffering. Second, just governments must act to the overall benefit of society. As Wooler BYU explains, that since public policies inevitably entail trade-offs and inherently imply winners and losers, they must be to the overall advantage of society. Thus, my first contention is the social safety net. Rehabilitation programs would be incredibly costly, draining government expenditures. As Prison Inside 23 explains, the rehabilitation programs require government funding, program expenses, paying salaries, expanding existing facilities, all overall representing a major capital expenditure. With over 2 million inmates nationwide, the article finalizes that the total annual cost for comprehensive rehabilitation programs could exceed $10 billion. Dangerously, allocating resources to prison reform as our primary objective results in trade-offs, damaging social welfare programs. In an analysis of a National Bureau of Economic Research study, Code 13 details that empirically, prison improvements come at the expense of welfare assistance and other government relief for those in poverty. Statistically, there is a clear link that higher prison spending leads to less welfare spending. The study examined 12 states where court rulings required sweeping prison reforms, and those states saw diminished welfare expenses that remained even once the reform orders were lifted. That means increasing spendings and corrections may take resources from where they're more important, as the give and take between prison, reform, and welfare is self evident Spending more money on one part of the budget leaves less money for other portions. Hurting social welfare programs would be detrimental to societal well-being, increasing the suffering of the least well-off of our nation, as McCartney and Gertner 23 explain that social safety net programs provide economic support to those facing financial hardship. 99 million people participated in social programs offered by the government in one year alone. 
Additionally, slashes to government welfare programs would spike crime rates, funneling more Americans into the criminal justice system in the first place. That's why Oxford University Press in 2022 finalizes that when we saw governments terminate cash welfare benefits, they increased the number of criminal charges by 20%, seeing an increase in income generating crimes and making the annual likelihood of incarceration increase by 60%. My second contention is unjust labor. Rehabilitation programs often take place as dangerous physical labor. As the Bureau of Justice Assistance explains, that rehabilitation programs, such as the Prison Industry Enhancement Certification Program, places people who are incarcerated in work environments, paid minimal wages, and given chances to supposedly develop skills to increase their potential for rehabilitation. While seemingly positive, labor through rehabilitation is inherently unjust, coercing prisoners to partake in physical work and punishing those who don't. Thus, a shift to rehabilitation programs would justify the continued and increased exploitation of the incarcerated, fueling the vicious cycle of harmful prison conditions. As Burnett 22 explains that prison labor is rationalized as rehabilitation and notions of prison reform offer up labor forces shorn of working protections under the banner of rehabilitation. This metric of rehabilitation programming exploits the underprivileged, using moral improvement as a justification for horrific physical labor. Lopez 15 describes these conditions, finding that rehabilitation in the form of cheap prison labor is where tens of thousands of Americans are paid far below the minimum wage, sometimes less than a dollar for an hour's work, and is seen as strictly exploitation. Public-private relationships with companies allow them to use inmates for physical labor, and there are moral and ethical questions behind the practice when we implement a system like rehabilitation. For these two reasons, I negate and I'll move on to my opponent's case. Starting on their value criterion of preventing dehumanization, they tell you that we should look to human dignity over all the root foundation. We agree on largely similar value criterions and that we should look to overall welfare in reducing things that Max tells you in cross, such as suffering in society. That means when you weigh under this framework, you look to the side that's best able to do that, which is inherently going to be the negative. Then on their observations, they tell you that we have an equal burden as a principle and not a policy. But remember that we still have to debate out the implementation of a government policy action. We have to look to how implementing rehabilitation would shake out in the status quo because the resolution asks us to examine what the United States government ought to do for their primary objective. But Second, they tell you that we shall still punish people in a world of the affirmative. But remember that we can still seek a balance of both, and the affirmative needs to uniquely prove to you why it ought to be the primary objective above all. You can go to their first contention, where they tell you that we see incarcerated people in a lot of overcrowding and dehumanization conditions. But as an overall response, we would see that these dehumanizing conditions still happen in either world. Remember that they pin down the problem of overcrowding to you. Instead, we would see more people funneled into the criminal justice system when we see incarceration increase in a world where we no longer have these welfare programs operating at their best efficiency. That's the Oxford University evidence that tells you very clearly that incarceration increased by 60% in a world where we saw slashes to welfare programs, which means the problem is best solved by the negative. But second, we would say that Levin 21 tells you specifically that recidivism and repeat offending rates are already dropping fast. That's because we've seen the drop considerably in the return to prison rate, and people are less likely to return to prison in the past decade. That's because we've seen specific changes in the behavior of the criminal justice system, investments in reentry programs, and overall declining arrests for minor offenses. That means when you look to specific arguments like their substance abuse disorder argument and also their argument about education. We see that the government is effectively rolling out programs for re-entry and being able to reintegrate people into society without having to pursue rehabilitation as their primary objective. That means we can have a balance of both, but that only comes in the negative world where we look to things like maintaining social welfare programs, but also very specifically that this evidence outlines that we are already shifting towards re-entry programs in our current world to reintegrate criminals back into society in meaningful and effective ways without rehabilitation as our first objective. But on their second contention, they tell you that we see recidivism dropping fast. Remember that the idea of career crime, or we see that recidivism is already dropping fast. But on the idea of creating career criminals, we would see that this still happens in either world. They don't prove to you uniquely how they solve for the unsafe conditions of prisons. For example, overcrowding will happen whether or not you affirm or negate, which means you look to the world that's best able to reduce the number of people who enter the system in the first place. But on the specific warranting of overall having drug abuse and seeing things like employment, we would say that overall Human Rights Watch 15 finds that the Bureau of Prisons sabotages substance abuse rehabilitation programs, so affirming fails to actually do this effectively. That's because whenever the government has tried to implement these programs towards certain prisons in the United States, we haven't seen them actually implement effective drug rehabilitation programs, and people still struggle at these same rates, which means if you want to keep people out of the system to begin with, you negate. But then this is also a hyper-specific case of drug studies and education, which we can do in either world. That doesn't mean that it has to have rehabilitation first. But on their last contention, specifically looking at recidivism, we would say that Beaudry 21 tells you that looking at a meta-analysis of the 30 best recidivism studies to date, there's no clear impact of rehabilitation 
because it fails to address the root social issues that put people in prisons in the first place. That's why we would also see that we have to uphold things like these social welfare programs. But finally, the examples of other countries like Norway and dehumanizing issues won't be the same in the current world because the United States has fundamentally different government and country operating systems than the ones that they talk about, which means you're going to be negating. And I'm ready for cross-examination. Not ready. Okay. Good. Let's begin now. Let's talk about your criterion. Why do people suffer? Sure. So we'd say that people suffer when there are different things that like implement the government, for example, passes policies that may inflict suffering, which is why we should look to ways that we're best able to reduce them. Any okay, just government should not How do we evaluate that we're minimizing suffering? Is it Pardon? like a societal level? Is it individualized? On a societal level, but we would say that includes looking to an individualized level because we have to make sure that the majority number of citizens are able to live a life that is overall flourishing and well-being. As a government actor, we have the obligation to be doing okay, that. Okay, that's fine. Let's move on to your contention one. Let's sure. talk about this funding point. You say that the total cost would be $10 billion a year, yeah? Correct. How much money does the U.S. spend every year? Um, I, on the prison system? In general. I don't offer a specific six number. $6 trillion. That. Why sure. can't the U.S. spend $10 billion if they spend $6 trillion a sure. year? So if you look to $6 trillion as how the government spends, obviously the government funds a lot of different sectors and a lot of different things that aren't specifically the prison system. But when you look to the prison system and evaluate this debate in a vacuum of the prison system specifically, that is a significant part of money that it would take away directly from social welfare programs. That's okay. the co-study that tells you, even in the past, we've still seen those trade-offs okay, directly from government fine. welfare Let's programs. Let's look to the example of Norway, which I give you in case. Sure. Norway way we would agree has great welfare programs and they also have rehabilitation as I talk about. Why can't the two coexist if they literally sure. do in so that So like country? I tell you at the end of my speech, a lot of different governments that you bring up like Norway and Singapore have fundamentally different like operating bases of how they like actually function as a government than the US does. For example, Norway has a way smaller population than the United States does. So when they fund something like a prison system, they don't have to put so many resources towards them. Okay. And also so fuel. is the issue that the US population is too large or what is it unique about the US that Norway doesn't have or the US can't sure. allocate their budget without sacrificing welfare. Yeah, so we'd see population is a really big thing. If the United States has 300 million people compared to Norway's much smaller country, that's obviously a worse issue. But second, the specific analysis on the social welfare argument is that we've seen the United States empirically look to slashing welfare programs when they implemented prison reform court orders. Okay, that's so, the key study. So here. let's talk about the specific evidence. So what, what evidence tells us that specifically if we increase funding towards rehabilitation, we must specifically cut from sure. welfare? So that's the Bureau of Economic Research study that tells you specifically when we look to an empirical level we have directly seen that when the court ordered prison reforms towards different states like california and this is looking we saw direct that in the past in the past when we've looked at rehabilitation it's led to drops in welfare we've yeah we've seen direct trade-offs so with why would programs. we assume that if we completely restructure our criminal justice system to instead prioritize rehabilitation that the same thing would happen when sure. we're operating so under a different mean, system yeah so it's a really simple link level that would just mean that we're spending more money on the criminal justice system which means we're directly diverting resources to where the government has always look to slash first, which is these social welfare programs. The okay, study explains that fine. very cleanly. On your contention too, you talk about how uh, rehabilitation causes this forced labor. Is that yep. all rehabilitation or just one type? Sure, so that's an example of your rehabilitation program specifically. But is it like every type of rehabilitation does that or like it's some- It's a specific example of rehabilitation programs in the United States, like the employment ones you talk about that force people into for like coerced labor rather than looking to more effective rehabilitation systems. Okay, that's time. This is the 2024 High School Debate Championship at the City Club of Cleveland, the Citadel of Free Speech. Brooke Gamechu from Hawken is negating, and Max Zuckerman from Solon is affirming. And Caitlin, I mentioned this last year, but you were too busy preparing for your next cross. But I had some experience decades ago with high school debate at St. Edward High School. It was policy debate, uh, where you're part of a two-man team. At that time, and uh, Tom Lucchese mentioned this earlier, uh, there was no internet. Uh, our research involved, uh, and there was no cell phone, our research involved looking up magazines, Mother Jones magazines, all kinds of other sources, copying that out and putting it on cards. Tell me how research goes today, the amount of work that goes into it and how you're able to get the evidence. Definitely. So I can say I actually use Mother Jones for this topic as well. Um, so by and large, the process is very similar other than it just happens online. So often your research into the topic can start with a simple Google search, just understanding the background and the context behind the resolution. 
And then you'll start to dig a little deeper. So understanding what policies have been implemented in the past, what the effects of those have been, and then hopefully finding empirical evidence to support your positions as we've seen our debaters do today. How many hours would you say you log doing something like that? Too many. Too many. <laughs> so for a topic like this and, and these two debaters, getting the information, what, a month ahead of time? Is that when you know what the, what the topic's going to be? Correct, about a month. And so a month ahead of time, you get it. During that month, and by the way, the topic tonight, if you hadn't uh, heard it at the beginning or today, if you hadn't heard it earlier, resolved the primary objective of the United States criminal justice system ought to be rehabilitation. When you get that, your first step, you said, is to Google it. You're not then just taking a wiki entry and saying, okay, I'm done. So what kind of work does it take to get to the point where you feel like you can even make an argument? Yeah, so for me, I always like to find studies where I can believe in the position. So not necessarily that I agree with it, but that I agree with the validity of the study, that I've seen an example in which the positions I'm advocating for have been proven true. As soon as I can find that, then I start to feel a bit more comfortable. So you can believe in the argument or believe in where it comes from, from both the positive and the negative. That to me seems a little discordant. How are you able to say, yes, there should be rehabil re rehabilitation, or no, there shouldn't? Definitely. So the topics we debate in Lincoln Douglas are really broad in that if you're negating, you don't necessarily have to say that rehabilitation is bad, but rather that it shouldn't be a primary objective. Because of that, there's a lot of room within the topic that you don't necessarily have to resort to the common political talking points, but rather to find a point that you feel comfortable in defending. Does it matter at all who your opponent is? Do you, do you know about their record? Do you look that up? Do you try to be specific to whatever their particular style is? So in an average debate, you will not know who you're debating until you walk in the room with them. So because of that, it's kind of hard to adapt once you see them, but you can start to adapt your strategy as you go into rebuttal. If one person speaks faster, you might speak a little slower. In this case, it's not a normal debate, and so <laughs> you do know who your opponent is. Does that make any difference? For some debaters, it may. They may know um, what, the, oh, what the debaters may have run in the past, and they may prep against that. All right, and the O means that uh, <laughs> Max is ready. Max, take it away. Okay. Anyone now ready? All right. Oh, it's my phone. All right, let's begin now. We agree on justice. Let's talk about the criterion debate. My opponent says that our criterions are similar. I disagree they're not. They don't give you any attacks on dehumanization, so all three warrants stand. On my opponent's side of the flow, three attacks. First, they tell you that I ask my opponent why do people suffer in cross-examination, and they say there's a lot of reasons. What I tell you is that the root cause of suffering is dehumanization. If we look at most moral atrocities, all genocides, all war crimes, etc., they happen because we dehumanize our opponents. That's why people suffer. Prefer mine because it's a prerequisite. Then on the second point, my, uh, if we look at the prerequisite point, this isn't a reason to value this as a criterion. For instance, breathing is a prerequisite to being alive, but that doesn't mean that breathing should be the criterion. That would be ridiculous. And third, the way we evaluate this is as on a societal plane rather than individuals. My opponent says that we look at the majority. This is literally dehumanizing people because we're reducing people to a statistic. We're saying, okay, 10 million people were saved this year. That's reducing people to a statistic. Their numbers in a machine. My opponent is literally dehumanizing these people with her own impacts. Let's move on to the contention one on the social safety net. First, on the funding point, four overview responses. First, the U.S. has the strongest economy in the world. If other countries like Norway can afford rehabilitation, then we can too. Second, human dignity will always triumph over any monetary gain. Third, Santa Lake finds that, re that rehabilitation reduces the financial burden on offenders and criminals, ensuring that they do not go into poverty. This not only promotes the rights of individuals, but boosts the national economy. And fourth, the Department of Justice finds that it's cost-effective to have rehabilitation programs and correctional facilities. Economic prosperity occurs from rehabilitation because because job training and literacy training promote economic stimulation. On some specifics on the $10 billion a year card, that's ridiculous because the U.S. spends $6 trillion a year, so there's no reason why we can't allocate some of the budget without cutting, cutting the social safety net. Norway is a living example of how it's possible to have both. It's not necessary to have this trade-off, as my opponent makes it out to be, so the impacts don't actually occur. On to the contention, too, about unjust forced labor, a few overview responses. First, mo and most importantly, turn this argument as NPR finds that the Constitution bans slavery except as punishment for crime. Forced labor is literally happening right now in the 
the negative world. If anything, it's exacerbated. Second, turn this argument again. Look to the Bonacci evidence that I give you in case, which goes unresponded to, which finds that the current system disqualifies criminals from jobs, entrenching the dehumanizing crime cycle. Third, the AF world solves this issue, as both the Dahl evidence and the Wing evidence find that internationally, rehabilitation leads to increased job opportunities, preventing dehumanization. On some specifics, my opponent's entire warranting here talks about specific rehab labor coercion programs. That's not all rehabilitations. Look to, for example, a knife. A knife can be used to stab someone, but it can also be used to cut bread. My opponent is cherry picking this one specific example of rehabilitation and saying that the entire system is unjust as a result. You can't let them overgeneralize this. Let's move on to my side of the flow. On my, on my contention one, my opponent just cross applies her welfare contention saying that we actually funnel more, uh, more criminals into the system with welfare. Look to my responses there. Then they say that my examples of the uh, Institute of Drug Abuse and the Bender card are specific and they happen in either world. It's not specific because the Zuki's 14 evidence, the solvency goes dropped, which tells you that we need an internal revision to take place, which only happens in the affirmative world to solve anything. On the contention two, on the point about career, crim uh, my opponent says that career criminals are in the affirmative because the affirmative doesn't solve. My opponent drops the Smith nine evidence in the contention three, which tells you that over two decades of studies, hundreds of studies tell you that rehab reduces recidivism. They give you one single card. I give you hundreds of studies, prefer my evidence. Then they tell you this Human Rights Watch point about how drug abuse programs are sabotaged. This is because we're not focused on the, on the rehabilitation program right now. This is coming from the status quo. If we look to fundamentally revise our program, then we actually get the impacts that I talk about. The impacts of the Benecci card goes dropped, which tells you that all of these negative impacts, such as incarceration, crime, disqualification, from housing, voting, and jobs happen in the negative and they're solved in the affirmative. Onto the contention three, they give you one response here, the Levin point about how recidivism is dropping because of investments. If that's true, then this turns my opponent's entire contention one because investing into the prison system through rehabilitation drops recidivism. And yet my opponent tells you that it actually corrupts welfare, forced them to pick a side because there's no actual clear link there. The Futch evidence and the Ling evidence still stand. Thus, I affirm. The 2024 high school debate championship. Uh, we just heard the first affirmative rebuttal. Uh, now there's some prep time that Brooke has when she then presents her negative rebuttal. I asked this question last year, Caitlin, of Ella Jewell, who is the commentator here with me from Kenston High School. She was the 2022 high school debate champion. And I asked her, do you have a preference for which side? And she said she likes the negative because there was a little bit more room for her to make her arguments. Do you care? Is there a side you like better if the coin was flipped? Would you pick one or is it based on the topic? So my opinion definitely changes every round. <laughs> There's no clear advantage to either side in that the affirmative has the advantage of speaking first and last and the negative has the advantage of speaking for longer. So depending on the round and how it goes down, you may prefer one side or the other. I can say last year at this debate, I spent maybe a good 10 minutes picking which side because I just couldn't decide. Did you win the coin flip? I did. And you picked the negative. I picked negative. the negative. Uh, we have coaches that are here today. Uh, Trina Castro and Matt Hill are here from Solon High School. And we have Robert Schertz and Eva Lamberson from Hawkins School. First of all, let's hear it for them, for the coaches and all the coaches here. Can you, can you tell me, Caitlin, a little bit about what role coaches play in this process? Are they just like hyping you up to do a great job or are they basically like X's and O's telling you how to how to get it done? Yeah, so coaching is absolutely fundamental to so speech and debate. I'm lucky that my coaches are here as well, Rich Kowalik, who's currently judging, as well as Rachel Rothschild. I would be absolutely nowhere without them. Awesome. All right, Brooke is ready. Okay, so this is the second negative rebuttal. The order of my speech is going to be going down the affirmative and responding to some things on my opponent's side of the flow and then going down the negative. Does that order work for everybody? Is everybody ready? Perfect. I'll begin time on my first word. Starting with both the frameworks, my opponent first tells you that our like value criterions are different in the fact that I don't place any specific attacks on the warrants. But remember that in Cross, Max tells you himself that we're still looking to things like decreasing suffering in either world. That means upholding respect for humans, which ultimately collapses to my framework of looking to ways we're best able to reduce suffering. Then they tell you that the root cause of suffering is dehumanization. But remember that we only respect people as humans when we look to their innate worth by reducing the suffering that's imposed on them. That means when we debate a government action, we have to look to the way that the government 
government is best able to evaluate trade-offs and policies by implementing things for the overall well-being of society. Don't let them overcomplicate this framework to you. It's really simple and it's how our government operates and that's really effective in either world. But then they tell you that it shouldn't be a prerequisite to minimize suffering and reduces people's statistics. But it's not purely a numbers game. We aren't looking to whether or not 60% are doing well and 40% aren't. We're looking to when we pass policies, the most amount of people who are numbers, who are able to benefit is overall what we do as a government. That means we're not specifically looking to these like harsh number lines that they try to draw to you, but ways that we're able to best promote societal welfare. It's a very simple framework. Don't let them change that for you, but I would still win under the dehumanization framework and you'll still be negating. But go over to the affirmative specifically. They tell you on their first contention that the reason why we, we still have to increase drug treatment because it's not enough in the status quo. Remember the evidence that tells you that we can still increase these things and have specific programs like drugs and drug treatment without having to look to rehabilitation as a main system. They still fail to prove to you why it has to be the primary objective and we can't pursue it as a secondary objective and have a balance of the both worlds where we aren't diverting all of our resources towards this. But then they tell you that the status quo is rejecting these drug programs because of our current system and the way it operates. But the Human Rights Watch evidence is really specific in telling you that a lot of the times the prisons who implement these drug rehabilitation programs don't actually see it work effectively because when we overall look to massive court orders, the Bureau of Prisons sabotages these things and doesn't look in ways that they're able to best agree and uphold these policies. That means when you affirm, we're still going to see ineffective policies in the rehabilitation system in either world and they can't prove to you why the implementation now would uniquely be effective. But then they give you a couple of examples and repeat these things about Norway and Singapore and other countries. But remember where I tell you that the United States is comprised of over 300 million people. Norway is a significantly smaller country. Make them prove to you why implementing a system in a way, way smaller country on a different continent would shake out the exact same in the negative world in the United States. The answer is that they can't prove that to you because we would see it would be highly ineffective in the United States and the implementation would uniquely fail for the reasons I offer you in the negative case and I'll explain further. But then their second contention, they tell you that it reduces risk recidivism and they give you 100 studies. But the Beaudry evidence is a really specific meta-analysis that actually looks to recidivism studies as a whole and tells you that these things don't actually decrease recidivism rates when we implement rehabilitation. That's because it fails to look at the unique social issues and socioeconomic factors that funnel people into the criminal justice system in the first place to begin with. That means you would negate to actually address these factors. We will still see people being put into prison in high rates in the affirmative world because we aren't solving for the fact as to why people actually get into the prison systems in the first place, the only way you can do that is with a negative ballot. Remember that Max agrees himself in Cross that the reason why people get put into the system is because of background social factors. The only way you solve for that is by negating. But then they tell you specifically that we see that the recidivism investments, if they're already happening, I have to pick a side in the debate. But they misconstrue what the Levin evidence actually tells you. It tells you that it's investing outside of the prison system to re-entry programs. That means once people leave prison, they are placed in re-entry programs that operate outside outside of the criminal justice system to reintegrate people into society in effective ways. Make them prove to you why A, this isn't effective, and B, why we wouldn't be able to implement this in a world where we don't have to pursue rehabilitation as the primary objective. Remember, they do not give you specific warrants as to why it has to be our first objective, which means you can look to a balance of both worlds, which only happens in the negative worlds. But then we would say that the Beaudry evidence is still really specific in telling you that recidivism doesn't actually decrease because we see that they don't focus on these root social issues. The one key piece of evidence that Max fails to respond to in his last rebuttal is the fact that these social welfare programs make the likelihood when they're terminated increase the likelihood of incarceration by 60%. That is a very high number that tells you directly when we see trade-offs with these social welfare programs, we see decreases in the way that or increases in the way that the government criminal justice system operates and more people incarcerated and more people funneled into the system. But finally, they still try to extend these issues of dehumanization. Remember that the issues of overcrowding and making people career criminals still happen. They just tell you, no, it's better in a world with rehabilitation, but fail to tell you why. I'll tell you right now that overcrowding is still going to happen unless we look to actually keeping people out of the prison system, which you do by negating. But you can move over to the negative where you can still place your ballot very easily. On my first contention of trade-off, which is the first place you can vote in today's surround, which is looking to social backgrounds. They tell you that, it that it's like we have the strongest economy globally, but that doesn't mean we still, still have trade-offs when we pass policies. The US government has to make policy decisions all the time, and they still have to look to ways where they're able to cut back funding to increase funding in other sectors. They tell you that it's still very cost-effective because it solves for things like employment. But remember that the boiling evidence is really specific in analyzing that even after we made the money back through these prison reforms programs, those slashes were permanent. That's because they already took away 
away the funding and didn't put it back into the system, which means they saw near permanent damages to these social welfare programs in the status quo. They try to overcomplicate this for you and tell you that the United States spends $6 trillion each year. But remember that the more we add to this budget, we are gradually slashing these social welfare programs that are really effective in, in, in decreasing the criminal justice and incarceration rate by 60%. That is a heavy statistic that my opponent cannot fail to provide to you how much recidivism even changes by. But finally, we would see that the only empirical study in this round that tells you what's happened when we've looked to prison reform in the past is my evidence from the National Bureau of Economic Research that says in 12 states, when we saw prison reform court orders, we saw direct slashes to these social welfare programs. Finally, they tell you on my labor contention that it's a cherry-picked example, but we would say that it expands in the affirmative world because we actually look to these specific programs of rehabilitation expanding. But either way, you can vote very soundly on the social welfare contention. That's 99 million people who rely on the programs and 99 million reasons for you to negate. You're listening to the 2024 High School Debate Championship. We now have a little bit of preparation time for the second affirmative rebuttal that Max will deliver. And in that time, I wanted to ask you, Caitlin, when the Cavaliers' Max Struess made a three-quarter point three-shot uh, th basket to win a game, he knew as soon as it left his hand it was going to be nothing but net. I wonder if you have any of those kinds of senses when you're in a debate that you've just won it with this shot. Um, so I'm sure there's definitely some debaters who feel that way. I am definitely not one of them. So <laughs> you'll hear the debaters give what are called key voting issues, so reasons as to why they thought they won the debate. Now, of course, both debaters will have these, and if you're like me, you're always thinking about the opponent's way to win. Let's talk a little bit about strategy. If you're listening on the radio on, on WKSU, you'll be watching on television. These guys are going, if you were listening to a podcast, it would be like one and a half or two times speed. They're not going so fast you can't hear them, but it's also not casual speech. There's a reason for that. They've got to get this information in. The judges aren't necessarily listening for style. They're listening for points. Absolutely. So you may have heard the debaters reference the flow. This references all of the points that debaters have made, and it's really crucial that the debaters don't forget to mention a point. Max appears to be ready up on the stage. All right. Go ahead, Max. <clears throat> I'm not ready. Okay, let's begin now. For the last time, let's make it very clear the difference between minimizing suffering and dehumanization. My opponent says that we agreed in cross-examination that we're looking at suffering in general. I very clearly said that that's part of it, but that's not all of dehumanization. Then my opponent says that we look at the overall well-being, and in cross-examination, they say that in general, we try to benefit the majority. But if we're looking at the majority, we're boiling real human beings down to 51% versus 49%. We're not treating people face-to-face -face on an individual plane under this framework. We're not actually preventing dehumanization by minimizing suffering, we do it the other way around. Preventing dehumanization minimizes suffering, not vice versa. Then they say that it's not just a numbers game because we try to help the most and we, we try to give the most the benefit. But that's literally a numbers game. They contradict themselves there. On some specifics on the key voters. First and most importantly, this idea of dehumanization. One of my opponent's biggest points in this past, in this past round has been that we funnel more people into the prison system because of welfare. And yet a few points go dropped onto the welfare point. First and most importantly, the Department of Justice tells you that it's cost effective to have rehabilitation programs in correctional facilities. They tell you that this funding wasn't actually put back into the program. The problem is because our current system isn't structured to prioritize rehabilitation. Obviously, it won't go back into the program if the program prioritizes punishment, which all of my evidence, especially Smith-09, tells you that it's a bad thing to do. Obviously, it's not put back into rehabilitation because we don't prioritize rehabilitation. In the affirmative, this would never have happened. Then. They tell you about Norway. They tell you that we have different governments, and they tell you that I never give you a reason to believe that this will be cross-applied in the U.S. I give you three different reasons why we should cross-apply this. First, the Segafo evidence, who tells you that in the U.S., rehabilitation programs have led to recidivism going down by 2.5% and by four times for for incarcerated mothers. Then the Smith evidence telling you that hundreds of studies find that rehab reduces recidivism. And then finally, in cross-examination, I tell you that the North Dakota and Oklahoma implemented Norway's policies, and it literally worked per what say Gaffo and Smith tell you. All three of these go dropped, so yes, we can use the Dahl and the Ling evidence in today's debate. Then on some more specifics, the second key voter issue is going to be this point about welfare and costs. My opponent says that we have this 60% chance of incarceration if welfare goes down. But they miss the point that welfare doesn't necessarily have 
to go down if we literally see examples of Norway, of Singapore, of in the status quo, how rehabilitation causes recidivism rates to go down without great cuts to welfare. We literally see it happening elsewhere, so there's no reason to prove that this will happen in the United States. The third point, the third key voter is going to be this idea of labor. My opponent extends this contention with 10 seconds left on the clock. They don't respond to any of my three responses. Let's look at them really quick. First and most importantly, the NPR tells us that we literally have slavery as a result of punishment in prisons. Right now, this issue is worse in the negative, and it's solved in the affirmative. Then the Bonetti, the Dahl, and the Ling evidence all turn this by telling you that the current system disqualifies criminals for jobs and entrenches the dehumanizing cycle of crime, whereas the solvency per Dahl and Ling tells you that internationally and domestically, rehabilitation leads to increased job opportunities, preventing dehumanization. There's no reason to believe that the economy will collapse. If anything, we help more under either framework in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. Congratulations, Brooke and Max. That was a, an incredible debate. Please join me in giving them both a round of applause again. Uh, my name is Dan Maltrop. I'm the chief executive here at the City Club. And while our judges are finishing their final tallies and we prepare the awards, um, I want to just take a moment to um, to once again thank our, our partners at Baker Hostetler, who um, who help us put this on every year in memory of Pat Jordan. Thank you so much for being a part of this today and every year. We really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to ask both of you a few questions, if we, if we can do this sort of sideline conversation. You both seemed extremely passionate. And I've watched these debates now for 11 years or so. And um, you seem a bit more passionate, both of you, about this issue than, um, than some other topics in previous years. Brooke, I was wondering, is this, is this a particularly important issue to you? Or did you feel more passionate about this than you feel about other things you've debated, other topics? Um, I would say not specifically. I think that it's definitely a really interesting topic because going into it, a lot of people thought there is a very large skew to the affirmative because rehabilitation does sound great. But um, after doing some more research, I ended up really liking the negative side. So I'm happy that's what I ended up with in this debate. It's really interesting to look at like the implementation but I think like I enjoy all topics on pretty much the same level. I just really liked getting into the deeper research on this topic, um, sort of looking at how the implementation of things actually work in our okay. system. Tom Lucchese of Baker Hostetler is going to help us to announce the winner of the 2024 High School Debate Championship. Okay, today's winner is Max Zuckerman, Solon High School. <laughs> Which would make our runner-up. Our runner-up is Brooke Gamechu. Congratulations to both of our competitors. Congratulations to the schools. Once again, thank you to Baker Hostetler for your support of City Club programming. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Our forum is now adjourned. You want to do this for me? Sure. Good job. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.